So this is 14th of May, 1979. Can you remember, can you remember how you felt like walking off stage on the last night? Uh, completely exhausted. <laughs> Because there was this kind of myth that, like, that it was difficult and maybe you didn't you didn't have fun. But you've since kind of said, actually, you did really enjoy the show. Oh, shows. yeah, yeah, no, it was great fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit like being in a circus troupe. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun, yeah. But really, it was so physical mm. and, a, and a long show as well. I was completely exhausted. Because we know why you stopped playing live, which was to spend time with your family and focus on being a recording artist. But how long before the offers kind of started coming in. Did the phone start ringing quite soon after that, that tour in 79? Well, the intention had always been to actually do another set of shows after I'd done another two albums so that I could have uh, new material for the next shows. Mm. But then as I got to that, what would have been the fourth album, I'd become much more involved in the whole rec recording process and, and was starting to produce. And it, it just became... A kind of slightly different path than the one I'd imagined a few years beforehand. So I, there was no, never an intention to go for such a long time without doing shows at all. It, it just kind of went off in a different direction. Did people call you up and try and convince you to do it? Um, I can't remember. It's a very long time ago. And there were a couple of points where I thought that I would get a chance to do some, some live work. But for whatever reason, it just never, it never really happened. I suppose, you know, when albums have taken such a long time to make and then there's always this sort of process post-album where, you know, there's an element of uh, promotion but also making visuals to go with it, which I always get very involved in. And, and then before you know it, you know, it, the, the time has kind of rolled on and it almost feels like it's, it's the time to start a, a new project. And I suppose the longer that it got, the more I just started to feel that perhaps I wouldn't do shows again. So what changed your mind? I guess this is the question. This is the first big question, isn't it? Well, you know, it was like I'd done two albums uh, in really quite quick succession. And I really felt like doing something different. I really wanted to do something that wasn't going to mean sitting in the studio for a couple of years, just putting an album together. So it just felt like the right time. It was it was a fun idea to toy with, but actually pushing the button to go was something that I had to really seriously build up to. Was there a certain amount of fear before kind of making that call and going, right, I don't know when, but it is going to happen? Were you quite nervous? Yeah, I was terrified. I, the idea of putting the show together was something that I found really interesting and really exciting to be able to put a visual theatrical piece together but to actually step into it was something that I had to really I had to really work hard on because I was I was terrified of of doing live work as a performer again what role did Bertie play in your son Bertie played in your decision to kind of come back uh, he was really key because um it was something that I wanted him to be involved in because you know he's he's very um He's very creative and he was very positive about the whole idea of, of of doing some shows. So you've said, OK, I'm going to do this. Were there certain, I don't know, kind of criteria that you put down? OK, if I do it, then it's not going to be like, right, we're going to do six dates at, the, at Wembley and then we're going <laughs> to spend four years on tour. I mean, how did it, what were the parameters that you put for yourself, I guess? Yeah. Well, I, again, you know, I had toyed with ideas uh, beforehand, you know, if, if I were to do some live work. And I think the thing that made it really interesting for me was that I wanted to mainly base it around two of the conceptual albums that I'd done so that it was working with a narrative rather than just uh, individual songs. So there was already a kind of sketched shape in that I knew I wanted to start with a bunch of songs that would seem as if it were just a straight concert that would then slip into the ninth wave. And then the, the other half of the show would be Sky of Honey. So that there would be this enormous contrast between the two pieces because, you know, they're completely different. They're sort of opposing in their uh, atmospheres mm. and um, journeys. 
So what were the first, I mean, I'm sort of imagining what was the first sort of scribbles on the back of the envelope. It's like, well, maybe we could have this <laughs> and there could be a frame. And then what were the first sketches like? Um, well, I suppose I knew that I wanted to start with Lily because that was, the whole thing starts with a prayer. And I, I very much wanted this sort of involvement of everybody in the theatre um, being part of this prayer that would kind of protect us all through the journey that we were all going to go on. And then that the last track in that set would be King of the Mountain because that would lead us through into the Ninth Wave because there was this idea that developed that this storm would build and take us into that section. And so, you know, King of the Mountain just felt like, you know, it already had the, the kind of sense of weather and wind and this spell that could be cast that would then take us off into this different world. It was a huge amount of work and I suppose I probably started about um, four, 14 months before the show and it was it was very uh, full on, it was really full on. So the first thing was I wanted to get the lighting designer and the drummer and the lighting designer because so much of the show was about light and these worlds that would be created through the use of light and the drummer uh, because as you well know the drummer is is the core of the band is the, the heart you know, the heart yes the beating heart i was lucky enough to have seen the show lots of people haven't seen it so if the first movement of the show is is more conventionally based it's it's songs building a certain mood and then phase two the ninth wave ha has got a specific story to it H how would you describe kind of how that story was told visually when, when i'd actually written the piece originally and of course one of the things about working on the show was that it was already work that was so so there was layers of work going on top of work that had already been done so obviously ninth wave had been written um, a long time before and at that time you know i had had visual ideas for perhaps how to uh, do a filmic piece with it and you know so the basic story is this woman who is lost at sea and has to try and keep herself awake and try and stay alive and a as the night moves on she becomes delirious and has these, you know, kind of dreams and hallucinations and, you know, is in the water right through until the dawn the next morning. When she's in the water, the, the reality of her being stranded and lost at sea would be on film. So the film depicted her in the water, so the film was the reality and all the things that happened on stage, all the dreams were uh, live on stage. It's such a powerful image, the person alone at sea at night. And it's, yeah, as I say, it's an idea that you decided to come back to. It's a terrifying image. And I remember a friend saying years ago that they thought it was perhaps the most terrifying situation you could be in. Because even if you're in space, it's not quite the same as being in water because you don't know what's underneath it. And I think also there's a lot of psychological connections with water and emotion and um i mean probably you know obviously somebody that's actually in that situation is going to be extremely emotional and it, it just must be terrifying mustn't it it was a very complicated show and it was very technical one thing i really didn't want was i didn't want it to just look like a concert with theatrics i wanted it to feel like a piece of theater where we we were telling a story and so the visuals would be a natural part as, as the story un unfolded. Where were the different places that you thought you could stage this or was it always going to be in the Hammersmith Apollo? Well, one thing I really knew I didn't want to do was I didn't want to tour it. I wanted it to be in one venue. For lots of reasons, I didn't want to travel because when I'd done that before, it, it, it was really, it had really tired me and a lot of the energy goes into the travelling rather than the show. But also, I wanted to be able to do things that would, you know, for instance, if we were travelling, we'd have to make the set collapsible. There's all kinds of things that you couldn't do. We were using a sort of surround system that was, once we got it 
in and in place and working. All this stuff was like a permanent setup. And the theatre became ours. It was our theatre for that whole period of time. So the idea of like doing it at the O2, it was like, it's just going to be too impersonal. Yeah, it was just too big. I didn't want to do anywhere too big. Hammersmith used to be a cinema, so it has a very high proscenium arch, unusually high. And that served us really well because, you know, things like having the sun high in the sky and the big screen, having that extra bit of height was actually, uh, you know, a wonderful benefit. Can you remember the rehearsal at the end when you thought, this is ready, it's all worked out as I expected? I think that was the last night. (laughs) The last night, not even the first one. (laughs) Well, we were working right up until the first night still on elements of sound and technical issues. And then, of course, once you start performing it, that's when it really starts to begin because you're no longer dealing with putting it together. You're working on letting it just kind of settle. And then it starts to to walk along on its own feet, really. And it's like I said earlier, there's this sense of a continual evolving process where which is how i think it should be because the whole exciting thing about live work and theater is that it's of that moment it's not going to be the same again the next night the energies will be different there'll always be the chance that something that you weren't expecting will just happen and so in a way that's the whole thrill of the live experience as opposed to the studio the disciplines involved with live work are very, very different. The ability to exert control is wrestled from your hands a little bit with live work. How did you, how did you cope with that? Um, I was really nervous every night as a performer, uh, but had complete faith in everybody on the stage, everybody in the team or the sound guys. It was such a, a wonderful feeling of camaraderie. So I felt like, you know, there really was this embracing of everybody to make this happen. But I I was really nervous every night. And the thing that I think was the most difficult thing for me was to be continually in the now. Because uh, I naturally tend to race ahead in my mind. I'm always thinking about situations and running them through, um, you know, I think maybe it's that kind of primeval thing where you're trying to think, can I get to that tree before the tiger gets me? Will I will I be able to get up high enough? And so my head is always moving ahead uh, to try and get to the conclusion of, of whatever this, you know, this journey is. And once we started running the show, I had to be absolutely in that moment. I think people who are more used to Uh, more practised at live work, can allow their mind to wander off and then come back. But I was so terrified that if my mind wandered off, that when I came back, I wouldn't remember where I was. So I had to really fix myself so that, you know, I would remember where I was in the song. It was really hard for me to do that. And gradually, as as the shows move forward, I, I... got more comfortable with that because if the disciplines are different as opposed to recording work the rewards are different as well there's an immediate response to something whereas if you're recording an album the immediate response is limited to you and your producer and and your musicians so the rewards of playing live are just it's it hits you have a relationship you know throughout a song and at the end of the song and into the next song was that something you'd missed feeling people reacting you know it was something that i had spent most of my working time not experiencing so the thrill of actually having the audience there every every night in such a incredible way is is very difficult to express the feeling that was coming off the audience and they were like that every night maybe slightly different energies each night but really powerful welcoming presence from this fantastic audience when the tickets went on sale, in fact, when the announcement was made, there was a sort of media wave of affection, but interest and fascination with what it was going to be. Did you, how did that feel watching that going, 
Okay, this is this is what I've unleashed. Oh, it was fantastic. It was really exciting because, um, you know, having kind of kept it contained so that there wasn't a sense that it was coming, when we then announced the dates, I wasn't really sure what the reaction would be. Um, none of us were. And it was just... It was just so exciting to think that people were interested to co to come and see, come and see the show, come and be a part of it. it. It's it's quite an obvious question, but did you did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the shows? Did you have fun? Um, because it's a simple question, but with something this large, you know, it's a complex one as well. I think. Well, I was I was pretty terrified most most nights really and it was it, like I said it was that thing of trying to hold on to the now so that I would know where I was in the song which I think you know probably did give me an element of um real kind of concentration genuine concentration on on what I was doing um towards the end yes I was just starting to feel relaxed enough to enjoy parts of it the bit I really enjoyed was the end because I knew that I wouldn't uh, have to try and remember the words <laughs> for much longer. And also, I had these in-ears in, which I'd never worked with before. So these so. are little monitors so singers can hear themselves and hear the band yeah, when yeah. they're mobile. Yeah, yeah, so they go into your ears. And it's fantastic because everybody in the band, including the singers, are, are using these. And so you're very much in a sort of, uh, well, pretty hi-fi world, but it's quite isolating and you can't necessarily hear the audience in the way that you would if you were just working off off monitors so every night i couldn't wait for the moment when i could actually take my in ears out and actually hear the audience and what was great was it wasn't just sound that came in it was actually the air in the theater as well and so some nights the air would be almost kind of, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, sometimes there was a little bit of moisture in the air. Sometimes it was a little bit tingly. But it was interesting that you didn't just let the sound in. You actually let the the room in. Do you know what I mean? The atmosphere, the actual atmosphere. The actual physical atmosphere. Because you asked, and this is amazing these days, to ask an audience not to take photos and not to record anything and... By and large, 99.99% of people did just that. They didn't take lots of pictures. Hardly any people took pictures, and they didn't record it. Every other concert you go to, there is someone in front of a spectacular with a screen that two inches big capturing the spectacular rather than watching it. I guess that was very important to people to appreciate it. Yeah, it was really important for me because it was quite a small theatre, and so part of what I wanted the feeling to be was one of intimacy. And, you know, I totally appreciate that in a lot of ways now people are, are living their life through their phones. And in a smaller theatre like that, where also we're using film, theatrical lighting, which is a much lower level of light than you would normally have at concerts, it would have just been so intrusive. And I really wanted people to be there. I didn't want them to just be sort of on the other end of... A camera, even if it's just for a moment, it's you know when I go to shows and people have all uh, have got their phones up, it's it you don't really enjoy what's what's happening on the stage. It's very intrusive. So I thought it was worth asking, but I was really surprised at the number of people that did respect that, and I think it really did change the feeling in the room because the people were actually present. And it has created this air of mystery the air of mystery has kind of it's been maintained about those shows which once again is as we were saying that's something quite rare i am working on my memory of a show i saw once when i'm talking to you about it which is unusual in this situation but that's kind of cool oh well that's good that's nice you talk about that that feeling you know hearing the people how wonderful it was to take the earphones out and feel that response and see the audience do you regret not doing it earlier you're like, oh, this feels brilliant. Why Why did I not do this before? Well, I don't know. That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? Because I think, you know, had I done it before, then perhaps the same level of material wouldn't have existed. I was up there as somebody 
who had lived their life up to that point it would have it would have been a different show I, I don't know if I can say I wished I'd done it before but I'm really glad that I did do this it was a really incredible experience it was it was wonderful working with all those people and it was very moving uh, feeling the response from the audiences every night to have that connection it was very special I'm really pleased that that we all got up there and, and did that the first four albums and the sensual world didn't feature in the set list at all no why <laughs> well i knew that um the two narrative pieces were going to be the sort of main part of the show and so that only left a few songs at the beginning I knew I wanted to start with Lily. I knew I wanted to end with King of the Mountain in that first set. And then it was just basically filling in the hole in the middle. <laughs> and I, I wanted the tracks to feel, you know, really quite sort of, quite raunchy, quite macho, because it was a really, I mean, you know, a very macho band, very powerful and I thought it was a good place to just kind of do something that was a really up, up tempo, rhythmic set. So that then when we slipped into this more sort of narrative piece that was, it was in a way more withheld, that it would give, give it more impact. And, you know, there were obvious songs that had to go in there, like Running Up That Hill had to be in there, really. Hands of Love. It just sort of felt, it felt like just, picking the songs that somehow would have that kind of impact. And actually, I found that the hardest part of the show to perform that first set because, you know, there was nowhere to hide and each song, in a way, is almost being sung by a different character. You're almost having to keep keep changing who you are with each song. At least in the ninth wave, I was just one person. It's, do you see what I mean? There, mm. there was a thread. There was a thread to who I was, whereas that first set oh, it was tough. I found it very tough. Always going to get people wanting you to play certain songs. That's always going to be the case because you have such a large body of work, you know, and it's not as if anyone was going to be there sort of shouting, do Weathery Nights. No one was ever going to do that. But you're still, I imagine it would be very, very difficult. I mean, I know that people would have really wanted to hear this woman's work and there's some songs that mean so much to people i that's a difficult thing to do to pick those songs well originally in the first set there was an extra song which was never be mine and also at the end there were there were more encore tracks but the show was so long we had to start taking stuff out we wouldn't have minded <laughs> we wouldn't have minded <laughs> what was it three hours it could have been four <laughs> Yeah, well, this is it, you see. It's to be suddenly realised, the more we started putting the show together and running it, how long it actually was. So, What you know. nearly went in? <laughs> I'm not telling you. Oh, go on. <laughs> Did you read the reviews? No. I didn't read any reviews because I was too frightened. Really? Yeah. You should have read them. They were good. Well, this is what people told me, so I was really pleased. I was really, really pleased. <sighs> I'd find it, if, if I'd worked for 14 months on a project, I'd, I'd find it impossible not to see. What do people think? Well, of course, I was desperate to know what people thought, but I didn't want to read, I didn't want to read anything because if I read something bad, it would have, I'd have been going on stage with that in my head. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I presumed that when people were coming up and saying there was a great review that they were telling me the truth and not being kind, so... There wasn't any empty seats in the house, so I guess that's, you know, a good enough review that you're going to experience. Oh, the audiences were just... They were... You know, it was like the band was a dream band. The audiences were a dream audience. And actually, when, when I finished the shows, it did feel a bit like it had all been a dream. Had they really happened? They really happened. <laughs> well, I mean, on a couple of the nights, I believe some seats were taken out so cameras could go in. How how does it look? Have you had a chance to go back and review some of that footage? Well, 
it it has, uh, as you say, it has been filmed, so it's been documented. But I think I think it's a difficult one. There's there's lots of levels to this for me. Uh, one is that when you're in a theatre at a live performance. It's a completely different medium from watching a film. It's completely different. You are part of the atmosphere. You go on that journey with everybody in that room. That's what's so exciting about it. And if it were to be a piece of film, it would be approached completely differently. We didn't have any cameras on the stage because we didn't want the cameras to be intrusive for the audiences it didn't seem fair people had paid for their tickets why should they you know have the show disrupted because of that but also i think that music is really an important art form and i think that the live album is more representative of what the show was than a dvd that we would put together i think the expectations now are that people will put a DVD out and then what happens is that the CD is kind of tucked away at the back somewhere as a freebie. That's how it feels. And I th- I don't like that. I don't think it's right. I think... I remember Elton John had this live album out. I was a huge Elton John fan when I was young and... I mean, I said that, of course. He had this live album called 171170.0. I played that to death. I absolutely loved it. It was like being at this sort of... uh, The fact that it was invisible was what made it so exciting. It was really powerful and you could feel the audience, but there was no DVD and I, I loved that experience. So I'm hoping that people won't feel disappointed, that... This is, for me, something that is far more representative of being there because it holds the energy of the room and that incredible audience. And yet it allows your imagination to wonder at what it was to be there, but in, 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 I think in a much more sort of real way. So the DVD is going to stay just like tucked in the corner of your desk? Well... I'm not saying that we won't ever do anything with it, but there's absolutely no plans at all. And I really want to move on and do something new. I'm desperate to do something new, whatever that be. What's interesting is to be presented with a live album, and it's a show. (laughs) (laughs) To ask you about Prince, because the message that you put up online after the news of his death broke was so beautiful, and... Having worked together on a couple of songs, I just it, it seemed like you had a really good creative relationship. What was he like with you? Oh, he was adorable. He was really playful and really sweet. And I mean, what a what a talented man! What what an artist! I think it's a terrible loss that he should go, and uh, you know, at such a young age, it's it's incredibly sad. He used to make me laugh because while I was working on an album, he'd have done two world tours, a <laughs> couple of albums, a film. <laughs> Is there stuff that you recorded together that hasn't seen the light of day? It'd be lovely to no. uh, hear something. That's a shame. I interviewed really once. He's probably the best smelling person I've ever interviewed. Yeah. <laughs> what better than me? I'm not saying you're not fragrant, Kate. <laughs> In terms of your songwriting at the moment, has your songwriting been affected by the kind of political state that the world finds itself in at the moment. Because no matter what side of the political fence anyone wants to sit on, it's impossible to ignore the kind of divisionism that's occurring both in America and the UK. Is that something that you've been inspired to write about? No. (laughs) (laughs) That was such a good question as well. (laughs) That was a really well thought out question and just shot down. (laughs) Nothing. Well, I I haven't written a song for ages. I haven't been writing. How come? Um, <laughs> well, sir, um, I've been quite busy. <laughs> Why haven't busy. you done your homework, Kate, for God's sake? <laughs> I've been quite busy, sir. I've been putting a live album together. <laughs> I, I mean, has it been an, an easy, has it come to fruition quite easily, the audio recordings? No, it was quite hard, really. Fantastic performances. I mean, mm. you've got, you know, very well recorded, incredibly well played music but there was so much of it it was really daunting i mean it's like 
almost two and a half hours of music, really a lot of material to, to work through. I hope that there is a sense of the atmosphere that was in the room. And even for sections of the music where the audience have been brought back, that you can still you can still feel their presence because they were such an important part of the shows. I mean, without an audience, you don't have a show, you just have a rehearsal. It's done now, you can write some new stuff. <laughs> Is that, I mean, you've always recorded and released records. Tell me there's going to be another album at some point. This is not a full stop for anything, is it? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think it's just a rather big comma. <laughs> <laughs> do you, I mean, do you, do, you, do you find it easier to write than you used to or harder to write? Is that... Well, I think every time I sit down to write something new, uh, it's always really difficult because it feels like I've never done it before. So, you know, it's like, can I do this? So it's always really hard to get started and to then find out, you know, what what is this? Because for me, it's really important that each album is different. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm just making one album with gaps in between. <laughs> so you know, it's trying to find out what it what it is. You know, what's its energy? What's what's its direction? I was speaking to someone about this, the reclusive tag. And I was trying to explain that if you if you had a plumber that didn't go to plumbing conventions or didn't go to plumbing awards, you wouldn't call him a reclusive plumber, you'd just call them a plumber. <laughs> but people with musicians, it becomes this label, doesn't it? I just wondered how you felt about people still. It's this, it doesn't seem to go away. Yeah, well, I suppose people really like to put things into boxes hmm. and pigeonhole people. And I suppose that tag kind of hung around uh, for a long time when I when I wasn't making albums or between albums. Um, I can think of a lot worse things to be called. This is true. And how can somebody who's a reclusive get up in front of three, four thousand people and do all those shows? I, I'm not a reclusive, but um, that just seems to be something that makes people feel comfortable to call me that i suppose it was obviously an amazing experience it was obviously a really creatively fulfilling thing to do the shows and you're smiling at me already because you know the question that's going to come in a second and you enjoyed it and you and, and you managed to achieve something very special something that maybe hadn't been done with a live pop music show for want of a better word for a long time is there the temptation to do it again in some form <laughs> Well, the thing about that show is that a lot of the material, most of the material was already written. And to start something like that from scratch is a is another whole world of work, isn't it? You know, it's this thing of putting layers of work on top of layers of work, which was what that show was. I don't know. It was an extraordinary thing to be involved in, especially to have got the response that we did it was wonderful for everybody involved in the show to get that kind of positive feeling every night. It was really magical. But I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Definitely do something. I want to just do something new. I've been working with this project for a really long time now. I started the interview with the end of those shows in 1979. Tell me what it was like just before you walked on stage. For the first show, August 26, 2014. Before I went on? Yeah. Absolutely terrified. What else was running through your mind? Nothing, apart from, was I going to be any good? I, kn I knew that the show was put together and it was going to be a, a matter of letting the cogs whir and just let it work and, and settle. But whether I was going to be any good or not, I had no idea. And what about when you walked off after that first show? How did you feel? Um, I was so pleased because I felt that they liked it. And I was very relieved because I didn't get any of the words wrong. It's good to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt.